front and center, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. Hello, I'm Michael Maxetti. Today, my partner Steve and I are opening a new door so that we can begin to answer the question, how do we get government on the side of the people? And to begin this very important discussion, we have invited Tom Campbell, the founding chairperson of the Common Sense Party here in California. Tom is someone that I hold in the highest regards. I joined their leadership team more than two years ago and have grown to not only respect Tom immensely, but I must say there has never been anyone that I know or have met that is more suited to lead such an endeavor. But let me stop here and invite my partner, Steve Berriman, to give a more appropriate introduction to Tom Campbell so we can get started. Steve? Thanks so much, Mike. Well, Tom Campbell served five terms in the US Congress and two years in the California State Senate. He was finance director for the state of California. He served as director of the Bureau of Competition for the Federal Trade Commission. He's got a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago and a law degree magna cum laude from Harvard. He was a White House fellow and a US Supreme Court law clerk, a tenured law professor at Stanford, dean of the Haas School of Business at Berkeley, and he moved to Southern California to become the founding dean of the Fowler School of Law at Chapman University. At this time, he is a professor of law and economics at Chapman, and he's the founder and chairman of the Common Sense Party of California. Well, that's quite a litany of, uh, of accomplishments in a number of different fields. That's wonderful. Welcome, Tom. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Michael, for your very generous words. I reciprocate them entirely. It's been an honor to work with you and, uh, and I respect you immensely. Thank you. Well, it's certainly great to have you. And so let's jump right in. What compelled you to launch the Common Sense Party? Uh, Steve, I realized that in California, particularly and nationally as well, there were so many people in the middle who wanted to do some good for their country and for the world. And, and yet the, the uh, divisions of our political system drove them to be antagonistic instead of cooperative, drove them to uh, have to sign on to a complete menu of positions on issues when they may not have agreed with everyone at risk of being ostracized and, and drew, drew people to a form of antagonistic speech and interaction whereby your success is therefore a failure for me. Um, I'd rather see you know, it's both fail than you succeed alone. That kind of thinking is uh, is very distressing. It's it's distressing on a personal basis. Uh, I don't like living that way, and uh, it has caused, I think, a very unfortunate atmosphere in politics. Um, so I started in California because we have some structural advantages that I uh, thought we could uh, make use of, particularly the top two primary, uh, whereby we could improve that situation. When you, when you oh, 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 go ahead. Tom, I'd yeah. like you to expand a little bit, if you would, on those structural advantages here in California. What did you mean by that for those people who are not familiar with the structure of our politics? The two-party system, which is known throughout the country, of course, uh, tends to result in a Democrat or a Republican being elected. And a third-party candidate um, very, very seldom, vanishingly seldom uh, wins. Occasionally an independent who is well-known and able to self-finance does well, but that is uh, not enough to make a significant change. In California and in uh, Louisiana and in Maine, we have a top two primary, only those states. And the result is that if the all candidates run at the same time, whatever their party, the top two vote getters then go on to the finals in November. Uh, the French presidential election is like this if you follow uh, the European systems at all. And the result is that if you have a good show in the, fin in the primary, um, you make it to the finals and there's only one other opponent. Uh, that creates the opportunity for a third party 
only in a state that has top two. If you were not in a state that has top two, you might do well, but come November, um, you'll be running against Libertarian, Green, Peace and Freedom, Democrat, Republican, um, and Common Sense Party, and the Democrat or the Republican will, will always win. Thank you. You know, I'm, I having seen you have experience as a legislator, and that was going back um, a number of years, did you find, was this the problem that you found, let's say when you were in Congress and has it, has it changed since the time that you were uh, a legislator? It is the problem I found there, Steve, but it's gotten worse. What I found when I was there was the uh, Democratic Party had been in control from 1954 um, to 1994. And I was first elected in 1988, so I served in the minority. I left Congress and then came back to Congress a second time in a special election in 1995. So the Republicans had taken over. And um, to a greater extent than I would have wished, the Republicans said, now we're in charge, let's do to them what they did to us <laughs> instead of let's reform the, the system. Although there were some reforms, I do want to give credit to the uh, leadership, uh, Speaker Gingrich in particular. Uh, but uh, not enough, and eventually, and eventually came soon. It uh, it uh, declined once more into your victory is my defeat. Uh, don't ever work together because you might get something the other person can use to get reelected. In in California, it's strangely different uh, because it is so dominated by one party. The Republicans in the legislature are totally irrelevant. Now, when I was a state senator we still had the requirement of two thirds to pass the budget. And I was a Republican and the uh, Democrats did not have two thirds. Accordingly, we, we got along, we worked together. I knew that uh, nothing I wanted would get passed without the Democrats, but they also knew they could not completely ostracize me. So there was a cooperative relationship, but with a very clear senior partner. In Washington after 1994, when the Republicans took control for the first time in 40 years, uh, the, uh, the majority of the House became contestable. And every two years it's contestable. And that is a major difference because that engen engenders this concept that I cannot let you succeed because that might mean you'll be in the majority again. Whereas in Sacramento, it was clear that it was, is, and, and will be the Democratic Party in control. So the Republicans did not pose as much of a threat. Well, you know, now we see, of course, that the media is really, and the social media, et cetera, is really contributing to this polarization that's taking place. And, uh, and, and yet there seems to be the paradox of people really think that we should be working together, but when push comes to shove, they default back into their party uh, identification. So as a, as a new entity showing up, um, how do you get through to the voters that normally will main, mainstream voters who will, well, I don't totally agree with Democrats. I don't totally agree with Republicans, but my default is I'm gonna vote with them. How, how do we get them to, to look at this uh, third viable choice? By emphasizing each issue as opposed to the, the litmus test uh, menu. So um, take for example, education. Um, I believe that parents should have the ability to send their children to a charter school. Uh, private schools uh, are uh, another alternative that should be available to parents even if they don't have as much money. Uh, these are issues where reasonable center compromise would recognize as well the tremendous job the overwhelming majority of teachers do in the public system and our desire to pay more for those who do the harder work the, in, the, in the neighborhood schools that aren't doing so well. So that is a middle ground, but if you say you're for charter schools or or uh, supporting uh, alternatives to the public schools, you will never be supported by the Democratic Party. Uh, and on the Republican side, uh, the, the danger is that the political union, the California Teachers Union has become such dominant in the Democratic Party uh, that it has oftentimes been the case Republicans will uh, oppose something simply because the teachers union wants it. Uh, so let's start with education. There was a middle, there's a middle position. Higher salaries for the teachers in the tougher schools and um, more charter schools, lift the cap on charter schools. 
uh, give the ability to move your children uh, between schools as your as your parents uh, think think best. Uh, another example is as in is environment. Uh, once again, the Democratic Party is largely characterized by the the coastal left, uh, and the Republican Party by the Central Valley uh, uh, agriculture. The the proper answer is to price water at its replacement cost and allocate water according to the market uh, with recognition of both needs. Uh, the Democrats would never support my idea that you actually have to price water for environmental purposes, but how else do you know it's comparative value? And, uh, and the Republicans were not all that interested in getting more uh, uh, in, uh, entitlements for environmental causes. Uh, although if you paid for it, it would be a reflection of the market. So there's another example, go to the issue in other words. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell a quick anecdote if you've got time for it. I, when I was running for United States Senate, I did an interview in Bakersfield, California with the uh, newspaper there, the Californian. And I was asked my view of, of water and I went into a rather long description about pricing water and the economics of it. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I talked to the reporter and he said, you know, we had Barbara Boxer in the next day and we asked her opinion on water. And she said, my view on water is we need more. Uh, and uh, she, <laughs> she, uh, she won, uh, I, I did not. We weren't running against each other then, we were both in our primary. Uh, but but uh, Senator Boxer at the time, Congresswoman Boxer certainly uh, knew better than to get into the specifics. Uh, say as little as you can and count on the diehards who are going to support you because you have a D after your name. And uh, she, she knew the system better than I. Well, they say that in, in these times of conflict, the first thing that dies is nuance. Uh, yeah. and, and so, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like, as the Swami would say, you're proposing a sane world, you must be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Uh, yes, you're right, nuance dies. Uh, and the parties win elections by characterizing uh, in, in very bright colors as opposed to te tem temperate colors. I'll, I'll, I'll give another example. Uh, I supported and do support a, a carbon tax. Uh, that is a sensible way to allocate uh, the uh, global warming gases to higher productive uses and achieve an overall reduction. Uh, when I was running for United States Senate, uh, I, I got a call from uh, a couple of very influential um, uh, uh, social media people on the Republican side. And they said, you cannot support a tax. And I said, well, look, it's a carbon tax and the proceeds go to help those workers who were displaced because they were in carbon producing industries, greenhouse gas producing industries. And um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Grover Norquist was head of the National Taxpayers Group. And uh, it was he who said to me, you, you don't get it. We Republicans have to be clear, no taxes, no matter what. That's our message. And I said, no, I can't say that. Uh, similarly, there was a debate you might remember in the, I think it was in the 96 Republican candidates. Um, and the question was, will any of you uh, in this debate support a program of $10 of, ta of, of, uh, of cuts in spending if you get $1 of tax increase to get at the deficit? I said, sure, I'll take that. And uh, the, uh, the Republican candidates for president, of whom there were like a dozen, not one raised his or her hand. 10 to one, of course you take 10 to one. Ronald Reagan would have taken 10 to one. Uh, but the, the, the ability to be, to be uh, sensible in the middle is, is gone. Well, you know, I, it's very curious that you've chosen the name Common Sense Party, of course. I'm, I'm just curious as to, I mean, I have a sense of why you've chosen that. I think the people commonly sense that there's something that needs to change. Why did you pick the Common Sense Party as opposed to you know, some other name? Well, Michael can tell us a little bit about it but, uh, 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 as well. It, uh, it happened with everybody had his or her suggestion. And uh, then we did some polling and saw what people supported. So Steve, I don't have a principled answer for you. I have a marketing answer for you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I happen to like it. I happen to like the Thomas Paine. I, the reference to his, to his uh, treatise is uh, superb. He uh, was the, the pamphleteer for the revolution. So that connection is all, is all to the good. But 
uh, the other candidates were uh, centrist party, which I favored, but uh, was largely rejected in what we heard from the, the polling uh, as, as uh, not, uh, not being for something as much as being against the extremes. Um, common sense, that's what you're for. Um, so we, we chose that which indicated the greater degree of support. And, and uh, I, hope, I hope that that uh, proves to be true. I like the brand, I like that brand. Um, you know, this is, again, we're, we're still looking at this, uh, at the polarization that we have. Do you think that there's a, a way that the common sense party and, and your work in it can mitigate some of the toxic divisiveness that we're seeing right now? Uh, I do. Uh, it's a system change uh, that, that uh, we've seen in a couple of controversial areas where the Congress resolved an issue by giving it to a commission. The commission had representation of both sides or many sides, and it was obliged to come up with a recommendation, which the Congress then had to approve up or down, no amendments. That's how Social Security was refunded in 1983. President Reagan and Speaker Tip O'Neill put together a commission. Um, it was called the Greenspan Commission and they recommended a certain amount of increased FICA tax and a certain amount of postponing of the benefits. The vesting age was, was increased. No Democrat alone would support postponing benefits and no Republican alone would support increasing the FICA tax. But it came to the House floor and the Senate floor as, are you for reform? Are you for refunding Social Security or are you going to let it go bankrupt? That's your vote. Yes or no, no amendments. And it passed and we refunded Social Security. Uh, so that can, that is, that's an answer, but it's only going to happen in, in California and Sacramento if the uh, dominant party uh, is forced to reach towards the middle. And the, the Democratic Party has two thirds of both the House and the Senate, Assembly we call it, and the Senate. And the result is they don't have much of an incentive to create a commission. But I can see a commission on the allocation of water. It would make a, a lot of sensible compromises, but it wouldn't require that third rail for anybody in a, in a, a partisan situation. They would say, well, I voted for the comprehensive water plan. Uh, so that's, that's my, my, my suggestion would be to use the the bipartisan commission, the, the take it or leave it, everything together. Uh, one other example was base closings. So we had three rounds of closing bases after the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, we'd never close a base before in the, in a, in the district of a, of a powerful Congress member. Uh, there, there were bases outside of Chicago where I grew up because Dan Rostenkowski uh, wanted to keep them. And the Canadian threat of course is as serious now as it was then. Uh, to prevent the Canadians from invading America through Lake Michigan. That apparently is, is what would lay behind some of these, these thoughts. Uh, but there it was, uh, Fort Sheridan and Great Lakes Naval Station because of uh, the power of the, of the uh, members of Congress. Uh, so that is uh, uh, another example. We had a bipartisan commission. All of the bases, yes or no, had to be voted up or down. And uh, I predicted at the time that uh, no, no list of, of bases would include more than 24 states. And uh, I was proved right each time. I think it was 23, 24, and 23. Mm -hmm. Because that way, every senator in an affected state could vote no, and it would still pass. Exactly. <laughs> That's really interesting. I mean, I mean basically, what, what we're seeing is this, uh, uh, you know, the parties have gotten way more into self-preservation, I would think than ever before. And so this concept of uh, public service seems almost like an anachronism. So it sounds like part of your job is an education campaign to really help people understand what kind of leadership is needed right now. I think you're right. And uh, particularly the, the opportunity to serve, to tap into the tremendous depth of, of experience, quality, knowledge, compassion, wisdom that we have among Californians, but they don't want to run for office because they think it'll cost a, a huge fortune. Their families will be exposed to abuse um, and they'll be defeated the next time because they voted for a uh, carbon tax. Uh, uh, so the encouragement of candidates is every bit as much of the common sense party as any position on an issue. 
get people into politics who are willing to serve for a short period of time, perhaps a term or two in the assembly, and that's that, two or four years, and uh, help them do so with the finances that are capable only under California finance law of by a political party. I'll take just a moment to explain that. If you're running as an independent in California, you have a 10 to one disadvantage in campaign finance. People can give 10 times the amount of money to a party, which then can hand it to the candidate. But if you're running as an independent, you don't have a party willing to do that. Uh, the common sense party is willing to do that. You can go to a donor who's interested in supporting you, ask her or him to contribute to the party and the party gives to the candidate, just like the Democrats, just like the Republicans. So that I can realistically say to an independent minded person, yes, there is a financial route for you to succeed. You uh, do not have to spend your own money. Uh, and this is what the other parties do. All that's missing is a party willing to support you. Um, Interesting. Could, okay. I'd like to key off of that point because that's a, a hugely important point about the common sense party that it will endorse as long as we don't have a candidate in the race and we're not an official party yet in the state of California. We thought we'd be by 2020 and we thought we'd be by the 2022. <laughs> uh, the powers that control the, the game and the field have not yet allowed us to, to get on the field, but that will change. But if we don't have a candidate in the race, which we don't now, we will endorse anyone who has demonstrated with their actions, the integrity to their words and to the people. Uh, we want open-minded, independent thinking individuals to get elected into our state legislature or state Senate. Could you go in and elaborate on, on the uniqueness of what we're trying to create here uh, and its principles of the party? You're so, you're so on point here. Uh, the, the idea is that somebody would go into the legislature and vote on any given issue based on her or his best judgment, as opposed to what largely happens, which is if it matters to the party leadership, you have no freedom to vote contrary to what the party leadership wants. And that was true in the House of Representatives as well as in the California State Senate. So how do you give the ability for somebody to act on their own best judgment, their own best conscience when the party is pushing uh, against them? Uh, the, again, the top two creates that opportunity. If the top two, let's say, results in two Democrats running against each other, uh, which is distinctly possible, I think we may have as many as 10 races this coming November, 2022, when the finalists are both Democrats, one of them will be endorsed by the Democratic Party. The other won't. We are interested in that other one. We are interested in the one who knows that the party was not going to support them because that individual, while staying a Democrat, um, will be open to saying, well, maybe I was chosen because I'm an independent-minded Democrat and I can get reelected using the finance uh, that is available to political parties through the help of the Common Sense Party. There are fewer Republican versus Republican races, but there are there may be some. The same thing, once again, if the regular party endorses you and makes you their candidate, then they will give you that matching money, that 10 to one advantage, and the other won't. Well, assuming everything else is in line, that the person is qualified and, and, uh, and thoughtful, we should support those other people. No party has ever gone into the California politics with that as its goal, that we will support the more independent-minded of another party, um, but that's that's what we'll do. One of the things that I, it's hopeful that our audience will understand is the common sense party and what we're trying to create here is an opportunity to be a bridge to those people who don't feel they're being represented on by their quote leadership of their parties. If you're a D who's independent minded, who's compassionate, who wants to move forward and who's not going to adhere to, to the hard lines of the orthodoxy of the leadership of the democratic party, or you're an independent compassionate Republican who again opposes the, the stark orthodoxy of the Republican leadership, or you're not just a single issue voter in the, in the green party or, or, or someone devoted to libertarian principles open-minded people, people who are not being represented, the Common Sense Party is a bridge to bring them into the process to be able to make not just a voice heard, but to make real actionable 
action in legislature to, to be there and then make a become a bridge to move forward to help the D's and the R's and others come together and move forward. You're, you're, you're so right. And that's a compliment to uh, what we were just discussing. So help the more independent minded Democrat, help the more independent minded Republican in the Democrat versus Democrat race and the Republican versus Republican race. But, but how about our own party? Create a home for somebody who has a list of beliefs that may not be identical to mine or yours, Michael, in the common sense party, but you're welcome to join and you're welcome to put common sense party after your name. One of the structural ways we have of protecting that is that our platform requires a three quarters approval before any plank on a policy issue goes into the platform. Um, we do not want people to be driven away because they cannot agree to the, uh, the list of, of issues that the other two, the two major parties uh, require. So uh, you can have virtually any view on major issue and still be welcome in the common sense party, provided you show respect for people who have a different view. You know, this is this is really a very, very interesting approach because, you know, you're you're saying well, you want three quarters of, of approval as that of the of the people who are call themselves members of the party. How would they express what they support? Oh, we have a process uh, ready. Once you become a member of the party, you entered into a digital database and we have an ongoing refreshing mechanism for the platform with uh, people able to put forward ideas, have those ideas lay before the membership. Um, the internet obviously and social media make this hugely possible. It wasn't possible 20 years ago. And, uh, and then have an electronic vote. So it's an ongoing dynamic uh, process for support of positions and support of candidates. It, it's an amazingly functional idea. Uh, <laughs> I mean, really, if you, if you think about it, because here are all of the underrepresented people who have to wait two years to vote for somebody who's not really gonna represent them. So here there's representation going on. Uh, a colleague of ours, Richard Lang, uh, who has a company called uh, Democrasoft has created something called, uh, he's got a book called Virtual Country and he has uh, uh, something he calls advisory voting platform that he's been working on, uh, you know, putting together the board and funding. That's what you're talking about. It gives people inside of a constituency a way to voice their preferences. And of course, as you know, what happens is there are certain issues that the majority of people in the country would agree on, but because they don't match the narratives of the two polit political parties, the, you know, we can't have that, that common sense center um, that's been so missing in our so-called system. Well, I got to look up that software. It sounds like that might be. I'll, I'll hook you up with Richard. I'll, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you a link to his book. Uh, I would like because it, he's been working on this for for a while. And what you're talking about is exactly that that nobody else is doing. It's a way that invites people in who would otherwise be excluded. Wow. One of the unique things about the the parties I get asked often about is that we don't have this great organization, all these structural things built. And I tell people, one of the reasons they're not built is because we're just providing the seed of the idea for the party, this organization. The DNA of our members all will contribute to how it, how it evolves. We want to be a, create a party, and I hate to use the term party because of what it connotes with the way current organizations, political organizations are done, but we want to be able to reflect the, the modern consciousness of the people uh, and take advantage of the technology and bring them together so that we can create a new way to govern that reflects the needs of the people. Uh, and when we ask the question about, you know, or say we have to get government on the side of people, we believe that this type of party is that first major adjacent possible step that can be done that will break through the stranglehold, if you will, or the monopolies of like in California, every state seems to have a monopoly. It's either a D state or an R state. Uh, but 
that excludes the majority of people. Uh, yeah. It's a party for the rest of us, uh, Michael. Uh, and we, I think this will follow uh, organically from the kind of person who would be elected. So we were speaking just a while ago about the platform and how we are seeking to be open and inviting. And, and Steve mentioned the, a system, a software system that might be uh, facilitating of that. I think it happens organically as well once you get thoughtful people who are independent into the legislature in an environment where they would not otherwise have had a passage to get in. Uh, otherwise, what you have is the majority of the majority rule. And I saw that in the House of Representatives. I saw it in Sacramento. Uh, the majority of the majority it was called a Hastert rule uh, when the Republicans were in the majority that the majority party would caucus and not support any issue on the House floor unless a majority of the Republicans would support it. Uh, with the result that if the Republicans are, let's say are 55% and maybe 28% then is a majority of 55%, you've got 28% <laughs> deciding policy for the United States. Uh, that has to be broken and the Democrats did the same, I'm sorry to say, Speaker Pelosi followed that same rule by individuals. Even important as it is to have ideas and have them reflected in platforms, it's even more important to get people into the process who can come up, can, can offer their insights. You're a businessman, Michael. You've been a businessman all your life. You know how to do things in business. Um, sadly, most members of Congress have been in politics all their life. And that doesn't disqualify them, but it's precious few who have actually had to meet a payroll, who've actually produced a, a good and tried to market it, uh, tried to respond to consumer preference. Uh, those are talents I'd like to have. You, you might not want to pursue politics as a career, but get you in the House of Representatives for two terms, and you've done your country a lot of good. Tom, uh, a lot of people ask about a third party, the two questions I kind of want to ask you to elaborate on. One is people say, if I vote for a third party, it's wasted. What is the unique features in California that that will help break through this supermajority control single party state? What does this new party need to do to, to break through there? The uh, 80 assembly districts cut our state the, up into <coughs> roughly half a million people in, a, in an assembly district. That's, that's a lot, but it's not too much. You can actually hope to be elected and to be known in a district of half a million. It's really hard to get known in a state of 42 million or 40 million, uh, but 500,000, you can visit every newspaper in the district. You can knock on a lot of doors. You can get on a lot of radio talk shows and maybe some uh, local cable access. Uh, it's doable. Uh, so work through the assembly is, 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 is the heart of my present, of our present strategy. Uh, now in the assembly, the democratic majority has more than two thirds by seven. Uh, so seven out of 80, can we put seven middle, um, independent, uh, not wedded to either party kind of assembly members, uh, into Sacramento's legislature. I think that's, that's, that's achievable. Uh, and then the other point, the top two primary. Uh, if you have a Democrat and a Republican running, one or the other will win. But if you are able to make it out of the primary and only one opponent in November, you will naturally get the support of the other party that didn't make it, plus all the independents. And there are very, very few uh, districts uh, where that strategy together wouldn't create a competitive alternative to the dominant party. So the key, and I get the same questions you do, Michael, the key is to explain that in California, if you are willing to run for the assembly in a district that's about half a million people, will help you with the finances, run as an independent, and just make the top two. You just have to make the top two. You also help oftentimes by in an open seat, which there'll be so many of in 2024, four or five Democrats will run for the seat. Two or three Republicans might run for the seat. 
And as they divide up the, the uh, Democratic voters, let's say the Democrats, to choose that example, a, a single independent with the support of the Common Sense Party gets some name recognition, gets some uh, experience in the, in the media of the, of the area, they can make it to the top two. And then the top two kicks in and you've got a really good chance in November. So give me an open seat of which there'll be actually more open seats than ever in the state of California's history between 2022 and 2024. Give me four, four or five uh, uh, candidates who will split the vote and uh, one strong independent and I think we've got it. Well, in 2024 and 2026, uh, and there is a big shakeup with a lot of people choosing to leave early, knowing they're going to term out in 2024, 2026. But in the next three election cycles, particularly 2024 and 2026, more than half of the entire state legislature is terming out and was guaranteed to have open seats running there. And so to summarize what you just said there for people, if we can elect six or seven, maybe eight independent minded people who are not beholden to the Democratic Party uh, or the Republican Party that have not accepted their endorsement and money, we can break the supermajority stranglehold in the legislature, in the, in the assembly with roughly seven or eight. And if in the state Senate, four or five would break the supermajority there. Do it in either house and we've broken the supermajority. Would you explain what the advantages to the people are by breaking the supermajority? Uh, very good point, Michael. The two thirds of both houses are able to put an initiative to amend the constitution or any initiative, but I particularly wanna focus on constitutional amendments on the ballot without having to spend a dime. The going rate right now to qualify a constitutional initiative for the California ballot by, by initiative uh, is $15 million. So if you have $15 million, you can begin to participate. Otherwise you can't, it's, that's the, the artifact of the number of signatures that are required and the going rate to hire people who sit in front of grocery stores, we've all seen them, who get paid on a piece rate basis. If you have two thirds of both houses, however, you can skip that step, putting you $15 million ahead in any campaign for that initiative. Now I'll give you a couple of really specific examples. The last time the legislature, uh, last election, put on the ballot an amendment to Prop 13. Uh, it dealt with a carryover basis for family inherited uh, property um, and the requirement that the heirs had to live in the property uh, rather than just own it as they previously had been able to. So you don't get the benefit of the carryover basis from Prop 13 um, uh, if you are inheriting property unless you live in that property. Now that was done in order to raise more revenue for the state of California. It was not done with a thought to the family structure, particularly in agriculture, uh, where you might farm the land without actually owning it. Uh, but it was done by the Democratic majority because they had two thirds of both and were thus able to spend the, the money on promoting the initiative. Uh, the other example of the uh, two thirds uh, that uh, uh, has such an effect in, in, in California uh, is the ability to raise or even amend taxes. So by the constitution, no taxes may be uh, amended uh, without a two thirds vote of the legislature. Uh, so the, here, uh, the biggest area is, uh, are we going to have a wealth tax? Uh, the last two sessions in Sacramento, uh, the, the uh, wealth tax has been introduced. Uh, one of the upsetting aspects of our present economic condition is that uh, people of talent and ability are leaving California for states where their talents are more welcome. Uh, if you accumulate wealth as a result of your own imagination, hard work and entrepreneurship, and then are uh, taxed away uh, because you're a resident of California, well, you'll, you'll consider Arizona, uh, you'll, you'll consider uh, uh, Texas. Uh, that can happen as quickly as the 
Democratic majority wants to crack the whip. That's the, the phrase, right? the whip in the Congress and the whip in the assembly and the, legislature, the state legislature, crack the whip and say, we're all getting behind this and you better join it or you will be uh, ostracized from the party. So think about a increase in tax or even a totally new tax and uh, recognize that that can happen even without going to the people by a two thirds vote. So those are the two things that I focus on where bringing the majority down below two thirds just introduces common sense people to be able to talk about what that would mean to entrepreneurship um, and what that would mean to the ability to pass along uh, property to your family. These things are not gonna be talked about if the legislature is run by a majority of a majority or 27%. You know, you really, really explain that really carefully. There's such a value that just in that little bit of a margin, it will make a huge difference. And there's something else that's kind of a secret sauce that, you know, because you're, you know, definitely focused on having impact, you know, in the legislature. In legislature. Essentially, uh, I think it was Breitbart who said that politics follows culture. And if you're creating a culture where the people who belong to the common sense party feel that they can participate because they're being asked, not only are they being asked, you know, the Democrats and Republicans send you a poll and, oh, and by the way, send me $3, you know, that sort of thing. But what you're doing is you're really asking people because your, def your, your intention as part of your, your promise and platform is to act on what the people want. You know, you, you're kind of a clean slate. I mean, obviously, if the people want to go out and murder, we're not going to do that. But if the people, but the, the commons, the commonly sensed common sense of the extraordinary wisdom of, of ordinary people, when they actually have a chance to think rather than be programmed, that's huge. I think you're going to have a, a real grassroots movement that grows and the people go, wait a minute, in this party, I actually have a voice already. Steve, you're right. Uh, and it's not, it's not exclusively uh, just by expressing their voice, but, but actually by, by running. And let me recur to that for a moment. Yeah, exactly. A lot of, a lot of people say, give me a couple of terms in the, in the legislature and I'll turn it around. Oh, but I can't. I have to raise so much money and, and yeah. so, such a burden. I don't have a party behind me. You, and, 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 you know, some of those people might disagree with me, Steve. They might be in the common sense party. They might be running and get elected and they have a different view than I do about water or education or taxation or, 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 or incentives for high tech. That's great. Just so long as you're open to other ideas and you're not forming an idea because the party leader demanded that you do. One of the things that you touched on just there, which is so crucial in differentiating us from other parties, is we're based on principles. Principles over orthodoxy. Could you specifically elaborate on that, Tom? Oh, absolutely. So orthodoxy is what you see right now. Um, a good example is, I know it's controversial, but we, we, don't, we don't run away from controversy. Uh, Pro-choice, pro-life. Uh, pro-choice for schools uh, means charter schools. So two concepts of the word choice. You li literally cannot be a Democrat elected official in the legislature or Congress from the state of California um, unless you're pro-choice. There used to be pro-life Democrats. Uh, there are none. Uh, I'd say that without uh, being absolutely sure of my numbers, but let me say there are none in California. In this Congress where I used to serve, there were pro-life uh, Democrats and pro-choice Republicans. There are no longer a pro-choice pro Republicans in the, in the House of Representatives. Um, and then suppose you happen to be pro-choice on the question of a, of a woman's right to choose an abortion or not. Uh, and you also happen to be pro-choice on a parent's right to choose to send their child to a charter school um, or some other uh, alternative to the union dominated school. Well. Now you can't be supported um, by, the, by the Democratic Party. You can't be supported by the Republican Party if you're pro-choice on the question of abortion. You can't be supported by the Democratic Party if you're pro-choice on, on the subject of schools. Uh, and how about just being pro-choice, about empowering <laughs> individuals to make the best decision that they, that they can? So the principle that we stand for, we don't have in our platform whether we're pro-choice or pro-life uh, or pro-charter schools 
uh, what we have in our platform, uh, and our tentative platform, I should say, because it hasn't been a, approved yet, um, is individual uh, uh, decision making on the basis of fact, on the basis of our, our uh, non prejudice uh, and openness to others' points of view. And if your experience, Michael, you mentioned this earlier, it's worthy of emphasis. If your experience shows that you're that kind of leader who has shown herself or himself to be open uh, to reaching uh, sensible uh, uh, compromise, uh, then you belong in the common sense party. Versus, I can, I can go down the list, pro-gun, pro-gun control, uh, uh, immigration, uh, Pro, uh, pro wall or anti wall. Uh, I'll take a moment longer on, on just that okay, one. I please. Couldn't, couldn't uh, express it clearly enough. Back in uh, 92, Senator Obama, said, it might have been 94, Senator uh, 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 Hillary Clinton, uh, Senator Biden uh, supported building a wall. Uh, as part of the comprehensive immigration reform that President George Bush was putting forward. And uh, there was need for a physical obstacle, Senator Feinstein too, I remember, along with employer sanctions for hiring people who you know are not legally here. Uh, Democrats uh, saw the need to put both of those together and the Republicans joined them and that was the package. Uh, well, my gosh, uh, I cannot find, literally, I cannot find a Democrat in the Congress of the United States who will support a wall. Now, indeed, I remember raising this once uh, and, and having uh, the uh, uh, chair of the, uh, of the uh, California University of California system say, show me a 10-foot wall and I'll show you an 11-foot ladder. Uh, that was, <laughs> that was her, her response. And, and I said, sure. It's not going to be the, the, the complete answer, but we've almost completed a physical barrier in some places. Why not finish it and have employer sanctions and deal with root causes? I understand Vice President Kamala Harris's point about going to the root causes. Yes, but it's become an absolute as opposed to a principle. So what's the principle? The principle is America welcomes immigrants and we have a system for, for that which uh, promotes the best interests of our country and has a compassion element as well. There's no limit on the number of asylum uh, that can be granted. Uh, but uh, if you don't say you're against the wall, you won't be supported by the Dems. And, uh, and if, you, if you say that you think immigrants are a benefit to our country, you're on shaky ground with some elements, at least to the Republican party. So go for the principle as opposed to the litmus test. You know, we seem to have a system, kind of like the medical system, which is not about really curing disease, but managing symptoms. And so we have a political system that's about managing symptoms and taking positions and guaranteeing that those problems will not be solved. Yeah, I, I fear you're right. I've, I've got to say the same is true of the drug, of the drug war, Steve. It's, it seems your, your observation is true in many instances, but in the, in the drug war, uh, I remember when I was in Congress, a new bill was passed to give aid to Colombia to stop the import to the production and importation of, uh, of coca leaf and cocaine. And I said on the House floor, well, I now predict that the importation of cocaine from uh, Colombia will never cease because the Colombian government has a financial interest <laughs> in, <laughs> in having the money come from the United States. <laughs> probably not a heroic sort of prediction on my part, but an accurate one. Uh, why don't you take the people who are addicted and al allow them to, under a doctor's care, to have access to harm reduction? And if that means making use of the drug to which they're addicted, it's better than they're buying it on the street from a cartel and where the needle is, might be dirty and the, and, the, and the product contaminated. Well, what I just said is enough to disqualify me for running for office because now I'm soft on drugs. Uh, so what do we have? The continuation of the drug problem, the drug war, the never ending drug war, the incarceration of people on the basis of being addicted uh, and, and, uh, and, the, and the institutionalization of what should be medicated, not uh, imprisoned. 
And of course, what we have is tremendous amounts of money going to be spent on things that are totally unworkable that, you know, and we keep, you know, let's print more money to make sure we have more money to put into the system to, uh, to keep these unworkable things going. <laughs> At some point, you have to stop and use what you might call common sense, which is what I've been hearing nothing but common sense throughout this whole conversation. Oh, uh, thank you. And, and, it, and it's not that I've got any, any monopoly on it at all. The key is just let people in, hear, hear, what, hear their views out, and don't, uh, don't exclude them. Uh, and the exclusion is on the most awful basis. I, I agree with you. It's to get money to those who then will contribute to my campaign. That's pretty much it. Well, this has been this has been very very enlightening, uh, in in that you're 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 creating a field of common sense, and the people who go, wow, he makes so much sense. Why isn't why aren't we doing that? You know, and that's sort of the waking up uh, from the trance of being put into these two polarizing camps. Have it be so related to your own identity that you can't deviate from the party line, and consequently. Uh, the problems get perpetuated and people just, it's all about blaming the other side. Yeah, and sadly, it's become worse. Part of that is also social media. You mentioned that before, uh, but consider cable news. Uh, I know where I'm gonna get the right wing and I know where I'm gonna get the left wing. Yeah. We, we both do. Growing up, there was Huntley Brinkley uh, and uh, not that they were uh, perfect, uh, but they didn't have a bias. I didn't, honest to goodness, when I come home, I, I, I switch the channel from the one that my wife has on just for a moment and then switch it back. And the same, the same story is being covered completely differently. Uh, and, and that was very true during President Trump and even, and, and continues during President Biden. Uh, it, it, an example, President Trump could not get any credit for uh, Operation Warp Speed uh, from MSNBC or CNN. Now, he did a whole lot wrong and I did not support him, uh, but getting the vaccines made in record time was remarkable. And he took a great gamble of putting the money out to do that before the vaccines had been, uh, had been tested. But those left-wing outlets couldn't say that. And the right-wing out, uh, outlets can't say a good thing about President Biden. I thought he made a fine State of the Union speech. Uh, and I thought he was inspiring. And I thought that, uh, and I'd like his nominee to the Supreme Court. Uh, you can't say that on, on Fox. You can't say that on Newsmax. So now you, you choose your station and you get your news accordingly. Uh, and, uh, and, and then the way that plays into can candidates is you buy advertising on those stations. You can buy the local cable channel for the left or the right, depending on what primary you're in. And uh, you appeal at a very cost-effective basis just to your base. So that's what you do. Tom, could you explain for the, for those uh, in the audience how to to get in touch with the Common Sense Party? Uh, what is the next steps for the party uh, moving forward to have an impact on this upcoming election and beyond? Thanks for much, so much for that and for this marvelous opportunity to talk about the party. CaCommonSense.org is our website. Ca as in California, CommonSense.org. And there is means to communicate directly with me and with the leadership. Michael, you play a crucial role in, in responding to those inquiries. And uh, also on our website are step-by-step -step in step instructions to how to register to vote in the Common Sense Party. It uh, takes less than five minutes, uh, probably less than three minutes. Uh, we show you the uh, Secretary of State's uh, webpage uh, where you can accomplish that. Uh, if you're already registered in a party, uh, it's easy. You simply check the box that says other and write in common sense party. And if you haven't registered at all, you can register to vote for the first time there. So the next steps, uh, we tried to qualify for the ballot this time. We did not raise sufficient number of signatures. Uh, we're still involved in an audit, but I don't think we're going to uh, be able to run candidates under our own name. That's regrettable this time. It will be corrected by 2024. We can, however, as the leadership of the Common Sense Party in formation, give our personal endorsement and the support 
of this party in formation to the extent that we clarify we're speaking merely as the leadership team uh, to candidates who fit these qualifications. And I'm happy to say we have a number of candidates who have already approached us. Uh, we anticipate finding five state Senate districts and seven state assembly districts, those being the numbers that are necessary to change the two thirds in each of the two houses in Sacramento. And, uh, and uh, say these are the kinds of persons that we would support if we, if we could. Once we become an official party, then we can equalize that 10 to one monetary advantage. Uh, so that's in the future, we will be there by 2024, but we can do a heck of a lot before then uh, to give a voice to those who are without a voice to be a party for the rest of us. Some people have asked about us being able to put money and act like a PAC or a super PAC. How would you answer that question about taking our tax status and being a PAC or a super PAC in the interim while we're trying to become a party? I'm not inclined to support that, but of course, as I've said, I just one of our leadership team and one of our many members of the party. Uh, I, I, there are PACs out there who have political points of view and they raise money by emphasizing the divisive issues. That's how PACs get the money. Um, and they take these absolute rules like never a tax increase no matter what, or no tax, even though it might've been a carbon tax and the proceeds go to help the employees who were displaced by, uh, by uh, environmental regulations that, uh, that uh, were beneficial. Uh, so I'm inclined not to go that route because it is so hard to distinguish yourself from any other PAC uh, that, uh, that does that. Now, having said that, there are several PACs that do, do a good job that try to support the middle. But over the years, I'll be careful to not mention any names, but over the years, I've seen a number of them just gradually slide into the, well, this is what issue we want. And I've also seen some PACs slide into, well, look, the Democratic Party is in control. So I know if they may not be, this candidate may not be supportive of what we want on everything and might be the person who will do what the party leadership tells him or her to do. But uh, he or she's better than not, so let's support them. That's, I, I don't, that's not what I want. <laughs> that's not what you want, Michael. That's not what we're about. We want to create a party where people can support their own independent thought and, and give back to the country that gave us uh, so much and not simply settle for, for what's okay. So I'm afraid the PAC system has a tarnished reputation for a reason. Um, and at least as of this moment, I'd have to be convinced. Steve, do you have any specific questions? There's so much time we could get into and take a lot, of, <laughs> a lot more time, a lot of the specific issues. But you know, something that I would like to ask you to, to talk to is the voters out there are who don't understand the structure. They don't understand a lot about politics. The media and the propaganda works against them understanding what's going on. They're concerned with, with what impact is to them. Uh, you know, they have income insecurity, housing insecurity, and, and insecurity about how they're going to educate themselves or their kids. Uh, we've got party, or in this state, one party, every state's a one party state, it seems like, that tell everybody at every election cycle everything they, they want, and then the results are never forthcoming. Uh, it's frustrating, very frustrating. Well, I'll recur to the one suggestion I made before because I think it really is salient. Uh, commission, get bipartisan, cross many divides membership on a commission and make the hard choices. Uh, those choices are going to be uh, anathema to one of the other dominant parties, but put the package together. If you want to allocate water in the state of California, you're going to have to do that. You cannot continue to say that the majority votes will uh, will control exclusively uh, the uh, uh, allocation of a resource that's needed by more than uh, uh, more than one uh, uh, adherence of one party. Uh, so that would be my answer uh, in that example, as in as in many others. Tom, I think somehow you. You clicked on your phone there and turned off your video. 
<laughs> I didn't do it, but it came on automatically. Yeah, I wonder oh, why. Yeah. There you go. We're back. Okay. Somebody was calling, and I. Oh, I, it'll always do that. Yeah, it'll do that. <laughs> well, Steve, do you have any final questions? Yeah, I think I, we've really covered a lot of ground, and, and I particularly appreciate how much common sense this is. I think that this is a breath, it's a breath of fresh air in all of the political discourse that is so predictable, uh, you know, that you're going to have to be on this side or that side. And I think the more people that recognize that as a form of insanity, there'll be more people who, who say, I want to... I want to, I want to uh, follow this uh, common sense party and be part of it. I hope so. Thanks, Steve. And I sure appreciate your encouraging words. Thanks. Now, Tom, I do want to ask you one very important question that we like to ask each of our guests. And Tom, what is your vision of the more beautiful and just world your heart knows is possible? What a thoughtful question. It's a spiritual question, so I'll answer it uh, from that point of view. Uh, I believe that we are spiritual beings, that we have something beyond this life, something that's eternal, that we are part of, to which we will return and perhaps in different manifestations. So during the time we are in this world, what we should do is create the opportunity for individuals to taste, to sense, to be part of that bigger whole, of that bigger whole, uh, of that oneness, of that unity. Um, now that means you've got to be freed from the immediate demands of hunger and shelter um, and disease. And so America has come farther than any civilization in history. Um, but we have not yet done that. There are many who are still not free from hunger and disease and needs for, need for shelter. And it's very hard to get in connection with the spiritual side when you are so driven by the physical needs of, of just those basics. Uh, so a, a, the society that I want to see is the one where you have the individual free with the inclination and the opportunity uh, to connect with the eternal, connect with the spiritual, uh, and, uh, and where the individual realizes that they are God and God is, is them, that they are one, that they are worthy for that reason. Uh, and that means our responsibility is to clothe those who don't have clothes and feed those who don't have food so that they can approach the, the infinite. Wow. Thank you so much for that heartfelt answer. And I, uh, and I would enjoy that world as well and hope we can move there. If you're watching on the Locals platform or Rumble, please consider becoming a supporter so Steve and I can continue our work. And if you are watching on YouTube or listening on our audio podcast, please subscribe, please like, and of course, please share with your friends and followers. From Political Battlefields, to cooperative playing fields. It's a long journey to that more beautiful world and just world that our hearts know is possible. Let us go there together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.